Okay, great, thanks. Welcome everyone. Um, good to see you all. It's a huge pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'm Million. I work for KDAP, uh, that's our logo. We are not the cute company. We are the second biggest, so to say, in the cute ecosystem. Um, I myself am a Qt approver. I work with Qt now for, I think, seven years or so. I even maintain a small module inside Qt. So um, I would say I have a fair share of knowledge in that area. And I followed CppCon and uh, Going Native before that, um, the last years from a home in Berlin. <coughs> Some of that even uh, streamed live uh, into our offices. It was quite nice, but I always wondered, like, why is Qt so underrepresented there? There hasn't been a single talk about that at these conferences, uh, to my knowledge. And I mean, just a quick show of hands, who of you is using Qt? <coughs> Quite a lot, I thought so. I mean, Qt is being used by thousands of developers out there, and it's a very, very big part of the C++ um, ecosystem, in my opinion. And this talk here, um, it's going to be different from the talks I do usually. It's not going to be very deeply technical. Rather, it's going to be an overview of what you can do with Qt, why Qt is, in my opinion, really amazing, and fills a gap in uh, C++. So um, I'll give you a short introduction of what Qt is, and um, that's probably only going to be interesting for those of you who are not using it already. Um, then I'll show examples of how you can create user interfaces with Qt. You can use widgets or you can use the new QML-based Qt Quick API to do that. And finally, I want to dive into um, the essentials and add-ons because Qt is a huge framework itself and there is a huge um, ecosystem around it as well, extending it further uh, adding new features and filling gaps. And then last but not least, I want to talk about a few misconceptions that I see again and again uh, from very knowledgeable C++ people who are apparently not very knowledgeable about Qt. Um, so yeah, this is going to be what I'll be talking about. Qt. Um, Qt has been around for a long time. Uh, it's more than 20 years of innovating what you can do with C++. Uh, many things it does by using, for example, code generators. We'll get to that later. Uh, it does stuff that you cannot do with normal C++ in many areas. Uh, thousands, if not dozens of thousands of people use it day in, day out for their job. Um, we do that. We see our customers doing that as a consultancy company, we uh, get called in and see the uh, wealth of um, projects that use Qt. Uh, it's very astonishing, in my opinion, to see um, how well it works most of the time. But sadly, it's very underrepresented at many C++ conferences. Qt is cross-platform. Whatever I'll show you here, you can do on all kinds of platforms. You can. Uh, run it on the different flavors of uh, Windows, even compact embedded if you like to do that. Um, you can run it on the Macs, uh, various Linux flavors, especially interesting for embedded platforms, in my opinion. Um, Real-time operating systems. I mean, those of you who flew here uh, with, um, some, um, uh, with a new machine, uh, it qu uh, quite possibly the um, infotainment system is using Qt already, uh, or it's uh, cars that are getting developed and they will get new infotainment systems based on QNX or something else using Qt. And um, on the desktop platforms and, and uh, phone platforms, you get a native look and feel. It's not pixel perfect, but it's getting really close and uh, fulfills its role very, very well. Um, and the thing here is that Qt has at its core a uh, platform abstraction layer that scales really well, otherwise this wouldn't have been possible. And we see more and more platforms being added and it works, that's very nice. So personally, this is very biased. Um, why do I like Qt? Why do I stand here uh, motivated to talk to you about this? Uh, I'm kind of passionate about it, um, but first and foremost, I like Qt because it's C++. Everyone who keeps saying Qt isn't C++, I quite frankly can't get it. 
because uh, it's very much C++. It's dozens of lines of it, and um, it really helps in writing efficient code. If it wouldn't be C++, I would probably not use it. Uh, then the thing that we at KDAP here, uh, especially when we do trainings and um, see new people learning Qt while we teach it to them, is that they say again and again that Qt is very simple. Uh, it, the API is consistent. It's very straightforward to get into it. There's no high um, entry barrier or anything like that. And this is, in my opinion, very important for a library um, to be used by many people. Uh, then there's the open governance model, which I, as an um, open source guy, uh, am very uh, passionate about as well. In my free time, I work a lot on the KDE project, and if Qt wouldn't be open source, or wouldn't allow open source projects to use it, such as Q, uh, KDE, I wouldn't have learned it in the first place. This was what drove me to using it and seeing, okay, this is actually a very, very cool tool set. Um, and the open governance model does not only mean it's open source, but also that everyone has a voice. I can go in, make a change, I can discuss with the maintainer of Qt Core why something should be done one way or another. There's no one company that says, okay, this is how we are going to do it, and they do it. It's very important in my opinion. And as I said already, Qt is highly versatile. You can use it on the desktop, you can use it for embedded platforms, um, phones, whatever. And the people in the Qt ecosystem or community are very practical. And personally, I like that. I studied physics. It was very theoretical. In the end, I decided that this is not really not something for me. I rather work on something that is practical in the sense of I want to get stuff done instead of arguing about the theoretical best way it could possibly be done, but then no one was ever going to do it, right? So. Um, this is something I really like. There are lots of things uh, I do not like about Qt. It's, it's a big project. I mean, it's very unlikely that it's perfect in every aspect. Definitely not. The three points I want to highlight here is, um, first and foremost, the code le legacy in, in Qt. I mean, it's 20 years old, right? Uh, there are places in the Qt API where this really, really shows. The biggest example here is exceptions. Qt does not use exceptions itself. You can use, as a user of Qt, your exceptions. That's fine, it will handle that. But internally, it decided not to use exceptions because of the fact that back then, I don't know, 15 years ago, 17 years ago, they decided to support platforms where the compiler was not able to handle uh, exceptions. So they limited themselves by saying, okay, we want to uh, support this platform, and now, 20 years later, we still pay the price in that aspect. And there are other uh, cases where this is uh, happening. Um, there are a few performance traps in the Qt API. I, I said it's very simple to use it, that's true, especially if you look at the um, containers. I'll get to the containers later, but um, they have lots of utility functions, and you use them and you think like, oh yeah, my code is so nice, it looks so awesome. But actually, it's going to be very uh, badly performing compared to STL code where you are explicit when you shoot yourself in the foot. And then the biggest issue I see right now in the Qt community is that there is uh, simply no interaction or very little interaction with the ongoing efforts of advancing C++ as a language. So no one is actually being funded to go to the uh, ISO CPP meetings and um, helping that out. And I really do hope that the companies um, are going to send people there and improving that situation. And I also, on the other hand, do hope that people from the ISO CPP community uh, look at what we have in Qt instead of reinventing the wheel in some aspects, or at least to see what is needed by a real world project to solve problems. So while I dislike these things, uh, I can actually understand and accept them. They're a fact, and I hope they will get resolved eventually. But um, it's not as bad for me personally as you might think. So with that short introduction done, let's talk about widgets. This talk is going to be, or this part, the next two um, 
sections is going to show you nice images mostly of what you can do with uh, C++, uh, Qt C++. Um, the first part, the widgets, is what has been around for yeah 20 years now. Uh, it's very old technology that kept evolving over the years, but it's definitely not that. Um, this picture here is uh, K-mail, uh, my personal, oops, that was a bad decision, sorry. Sorry for that. Um, that's my personal uh, email client um, of choice. And I picked it not because it's such an awesome uh, email client, which it is, in my opinion, but rather because it's very exemplary for widget applications. Um, these kind of UIs you still see and you will still see in 10 years, I'm pretty sure. In-house um, applications, for example, in financial um, um, companies or for logistics or um, anything very specific to a problem you need to solve where you show lots of data, like here. I mean, you have tons of views, you feed with models, you have trees, you can filter them, you can search them. It's always lots and lots of data. And Qt widget is perfect for that um, kind of application. Um, what you also see is uh, text handling in Qt is um, very good and it's very good at um, adapting to the locale and uh, internationalization of whatever the user is um, doing. For example, if you would get an email from a uh, person who can write Arabian, then right to left text is just there. You don't need to handle anything specially there in your application. I really like that. Or you could even display HTML content if you have to or want to even. But widget applications can also look very different. This is an example I quite like because it's uh, the Spotify Linux client, which is still Qt4 based, but it looks super different, right? Uh, it's still a Qt widget ap uh, application as far as I know. I couldn't look into the source, but if you just run LDD on it, you'll see what it links to. And uh, again, what we see are lists that you can filter. This probably again is fed by a model and then you have a special view on top of that, and uh, they just changed the visuals, and that shows how um, even cute widgets can adapt to whatever you want to um, display, right? Um, then the last picture I want to show is again a um, project out of the KDE uh, community. It's Krita. The, yeah, I don't know whether they actually started right out by saying we want to kill Photoshop. Um, they then decided to, okay, that's not going to work. Photoshop can do lots and lots of things. We cannot com uh, compete with that. So in instead, let's concentrate on a very specific part, on the um, visual artist that draws, so a painting application. It's not the, um, in German we say, Eierlegende Wollmilch, so the, the thing that can do everything from generating HTML for your website to whatever else Photoshop can do nowadays. Uh, but rather it's meant for um, painters and it's very, very good at that. And more and more people are starting to adapt, uh, adapt it in their um, professional companies even. And the thing is, it's again a cute widget application. There's the OpenGL accelerated canvas here, uh, making it very efficient. It's very nicely integrating with um, the graphics tablets. You have uh, custom widgets here for selecting brushes and things like that. And all of that is quite straightforward to do with Qt. So how do you actually use it? I mean, uh, the best way to do it, in my opinion, is you use or you start off by using the designer tool, Qt Designer. Uh, here it's shown embedded in Qt Creator, uh, the Qt SDK. Uh, let me put that straight. Qt Creator, it's cool. If you want to use it, use it. But you don't have to use it if you use uh, Qt. Personally, in my spare time, I uh, maintain the KDevelop API, uh, IDE, so um, I don't use Qt Creator at all. And I know many people use Visual Studio, and that's fine, or Eclipse, again, that's fine. You don't bound to that, right? And with the designer, which you can also run as a standalone application, you just click together how your dialogue is supposed to look like. And not only does that work really well compared to what I heard from other people using different design applications for their framework of choice. Also, the 
things it creates, the, the dialogues, they actually are very functional. In a sense, you can resize them easily. And these kind of small things, uh, and it's still going to look good. Um, so it's super easy to use this tool. And uh, it works super well, in my opinion. On the C++ side, we see the first use of a code generator in uh, the Qt um, field. You include a generated header file, uh, which has the knowledge about how your dialog is supposed to look like. And then you say, OK, set up and do something. Uh, I, didn't show, I don't show the header here, but MUI is essentially a smart pointer. Um, you could use make new here or whatever, um, make unique, I mean, uh, that's very easily doable. And then your UI is the view part, right? And then you have a model somewhere, the data, so you create that one. And then just uh, maybe put a proxy in between for filtering purposes or um, maybe you want to sort stuff. Uh, it's very nicely separated, all of that. And then you connect some signals and slots. Again, very typical for Qt. By the way, this is how you write signals and slots today in Qt. Whenever you think or hear people saying, yeah, signals and slots are so inefficient, lots of string um, comparisons, that's Qt 4 or 3 or whatever. That's archaic. You don't do that anymore in Qt 5. Qt 5 signal slots connections accept any callable. You can pass in lambdas. You can pass in raw C um, functions, do it. And um, you don't even need most of the craft that you needed in Qt 4 anymore nowadays with modern Qt. This example I just showed was a bit streamed down, but essentially um, here is an example of how it could look like in the end. Um, this is from my heap track UI. It's, I, in my spare time, I also work on a profiler, which I'll t do a lightning talk about, I think, tomorrow. And it took me maybe, I don't know, let's say one hour to write the model, probably less, and then five minutes to click together the UI, and it's fully functional and works very well. And I don't know any other C++ um, UI framework that allows this kind of uh, functionality with such simplicity of use. I mean, most of them don't even provide you with any reusable widgets in the first place. And remember, this works then on Windows, on Mac, on wherever you compile it, right? So Qt widgets. Um, it's a very proven technology. It's been around for 20 years, as I said. And it's super for desktop applications, these kind of in-house things or uh, rich clients or whatever you, you name it, where you present lots of data. Sorry. Um, it's not going. Sorry. Sorry, um, it's not going to die, uh, die. And it allows you to create contemporary, if not even modern, UI uh, for your code. So with that said, um, let's get to the second part, or third part, um, Qt Quick. I said Qt Widget has been around for a long time. And over the process of working on that, the Qt people realized that there are some problems that you cannot easily solve with the existing API. The biggest problem there is getting something that is hardware accelerated. Qt widgets, it's um, using, of course, your CPU, SIMD structures, and whatever to make it as fast as possible. But it won't actually use your graphics cards, for example, to offload stuff. It's super inefficient, hard to get uh, fluid, uh, animated uh, interfaces with uh, the widgets API. So Qt Quick is originally, it was developed in the Nokia days, so that's where most of the work happened in, in Qt. When it, uh, Trolltech was bought by Nokia and they wanted to put that technology onto the Nokia phones. I actually don't know whether they ever did that or if there ever was a Nokia phone that used Qt Quick, maybe the N9. Um, but what we do know is that these three phones are out there in the market right now. Um, from left to right, it's the Sailfish OS running on a YOLA phone. It's a BlackBerry Passport running the um, BlackBerry 10 OS. And Ubuntu phone. All of them use Qt Quick 2, latest uh, Qt 5-based uh, QML uh, for their fluid interfaces. 
It's nicely touch enabled. It's hardware accelerated. Um, sadly, none of these three platforms is really successful. I don't personally think it's the fault of Qt, but rather the big contenders um, out, uh, out there. Um, I use a BlackBerry as well. I'm very happy with it uh, from the fluidity point of view. So I really think that Qt Quick is perfect for these kind of applications. Um, you can run it also on existing mobile platforms. Here, it's, uh, this is Midland Valley's um, field move application. It's meant for geologists to be used on the field uh, to do whatever geologists do. And <laughs> you can see that this kind of touch-enabled fancy UI is actually also usable to get real work done. Um, it works on iOS, and uh, I think it might also work on Android. Um, I'm not too acquainted with that, but it's a nice example of what you can do with it. And then this is a screenshot that the Qt company puts into their marketing material, and I quite like it because it shows you <laughs> the different form factors and platforms that you can put on your uh, put your application on. And here I explicitly took it because of these things like embedded platforms with a display. It's becoming more and more common because it's so cheap nowadays to buy a touch screen and you can hook it up to your industrial oven or something like that and have a visually pleasing um, UI with the logic in C++ behind it. On the desktop, it's still, uh, or it's becoming more and more used as well. Uh, you can use the so-called components to construct something which looks similar to Q widget applications. Um, here I show the Plasma desktop from KDE, so it's very common to see that on, on Linux or uh, Beast machines. And this is again built on Q, uh, QML2 or Qt Quick 2 on QML. And they are now working on pushing it to uh, mobile phones as well, uh, showing how easy it is to adapt from one form factor to another. A very um, different use case, but something that many people need uh, is that you have your existing 3D content rendered in OpenGL, for example, and you need to put text on top or you need to put controls on top. QML, QQuick makes that super simple. And uh, the same is valid for uh, multimedia content. So you can uh, put shader effects on the hardware accelerated uh, multimedia stream you get. And this is going to perform quite well even on embedded uh, platforms. The thing is, when you write these kind of uh, Qt Quick um, UIs, it's not C++ you write on the representation side. This is QML. It's a declarative language. You state what should happen instead of how it should happen. Uh, it's very easy to get into. Um, you simply bind properties to another, like here, the X uh, property, so where um, the button is positioned on the left side, is bound to the checked property. And if I would check that button, it would flip from left to right. This is what this binding does here. And um, it's super cool then to add an animation for that as well. And if you do this kind of things in C++, um, it's certainly doable. It's not going to win any price on readability, uh, I'm pretty sure. I do hope that people come up with uh, patterns on, on what to do there. Right now, the practical aspect of Qt solved it by introducing this language, which is, which is actually not that bad. Um, but you must not make the uh, error of saying, OK, QML and JavaScript will replace all of uh, C++. That is not the case at all. QQuick is meant to provide you with a declarative language, which you then use for saying how something should work. Um, it provides you with a hardware accelerated scene graph, which is super uh, efficient and very nice to use and makes it super easy to uh, create fancy animated UIs and thus thereby making it cool to use it on embedded devices or for OpenGL overlays and uh, whatnot. But it's meant to be used for the representation only. Let me stress this point again. Put your data, put your logic into C++. Um, at KDAP, the 
companies that come to us uh, that have problems with uh, QML um, applications, they always, or not always, but often make the uh, mistake of putting too much into QML. It's a, the same issue you can have on C++ widgets application, right? You put all of your logic and all of your data into the widgets instead of separating between data and representation. It's a very bad mistake, don't do it. Only use QQuick uh, for the representation side. Use C++ for the obvious reasons for logic and um, data. And do keep your JavaScript to a minimum. It will kill performance. It will make it harder to find bugs and fix them and all of the uh, problems you have uh, with JavaScript. <coughs> so with that said, I want to come to the essential section. Because yes, Qt is first and foremost meant to be used for uh, UI. It's a UI tool called after, after all. But Qt is so much more than that. If you start using Qt and you realize that, oh wait, um, I need to connect to a SQL database and uh, I need to access the data in there. Qt offers you an API that is cross-platform and gets the job done. You have access to a date-time um, API, which also comes with support for time zones. Uh, something that I think um, there are going to be more talks on at CPPCon here. Very hard problem to get right. Um, here's one solution that's being used in many places already, uh, more or less satisfactory. Uh, I mentioned already before that Qt supports very well um, accessibility and localization. So you can sort stuff based on the locale of your user. You can format numbers the way he wants it to have it. Um, you can add accessibility such that blind people can operate your user interface. So you can hook it up to uh, screen readers. Um, you have uh, Unicode strings pervasively throughout the Qt API, the infamous Q string. Um, yes, it's not std string. It has no short string optimizations. There are many things that are maybe wrong with it. But from a practical point of view, it gets the job done really, really well. It's super optimized for what it does. UTF-16 representation of strings. So similar to what ICU uses internally or what Windows uses for uh, strings or uh, Java does the same. Um, and these uh, strings have, the, the string class has a very good uh, API as well. But talking about misconceptions, um, people think that as soon as they start using Qt, they have to use QString everywhere. That's not the case. Only use it where you want to feed or show data to the user. At that point, you care about uh, Unicode data. Anywhere else, for example, if you parse uh, raw Latin one strings or something like that from the disk, do use either std string or QBinary or anything else. QString is only meant to be used for um, putting data or showing data to the user in the end. Um, there are the signals and slots in, in Qt, which are, in my opinion, really well done. Um, they come with a minimal amount of overhead, if at all, um, thanks to the code generator. You can add signals and slots later on while keeping binary compatibility, uh, which is also extremely cool. Um, there is a any type wrapper like boost any called Q variant. Uh, if you need that, it's there. You can get um, file system access that's similar to what um, hopefully we'll get in STL sooner or later. You get asynchronous I.O. networking, uh, these kind of things. You can even use state machines, where, by the way, um, the C++ API for state machines sucks. It's so hard to write all the boilerplate code. I'm not sure whether any one of you had the pleasure of working with the C++ um, state machine library. It's really, really bad. A, comp a colleague of mine spent time on adding QML bindings for the state machine code in Qt. And suddenly, you realize that, oh, right, this is what you actually want to write. And, um, this is something we see more and more that people use QML, the language, so not the QQuick um, graphical part of it, but rather just the, the language itself 
as a um, domain-specific language for whatever you need in your um, application. And there is an API to do just that. So if you need, if you look at the language and say, oh, this is actually nice, I want to use it for, I don't know, my build system. People in Qt have done that for some reason. Or uh, what else is there? I don't know. Um, yeah, state machines is the obvious example. Then QML is really cool, and you should have a look at that. It makes it much easier to maintain your code as well compared to writing all the craft in C++. So um, this is Qt Core, or was Qt Core. This is still Qt Core, um, but also a few external modules there. Qt itself is um, separated into multiple libraries, so you don't have to uh, use or pay the price of shipping megabytes of megabytes if you don't uh, use all of that. But um, again, all of this works on various platforms, right? Uh, it's, if you start using it on one platform, you can be sure that, oh, later on someone demands a Mac uh, version of your application. It will work. So uh, especially here, I want to stress that you can use it um, to access services via Bluetooth. Uh, you have um, support for near field communication. Uh, I showed the example for multimedia integration already. Uh, you have pervasive support for printing and things like that. It's uh, very helpful. And all of these are things that many people don't realize you need in a graphical application. Because oftentimes, when you create an application, after, I don't know, a few weeks, someone says like, okay, it would be cool if you could hook up, I don't know, um, generate me a PDF report for the data I see on my UI, right? Um, if you would then need to start looking for a separate library that does the job, um, then you need to figure out how to integrate it with the rest of your code. With Qt, that's super simple because many, many features are there already. Or like inside Qt itself, or they are being provided by external um, uh, providers, yeah. KDE, again, um, I'm connected to that. I care about it. And they spend a lot of time in the progression from Qt 4 to Qt 5 to upstream. The various features they um, found were missing in Qt. They had it back then in KDE Libs, it was called. And they upstreamed a tremendous amount of work into Qt itself. So now if you need, for example, temporary files or directories and things like that, it's their log files, um, um, standard path uh, access and whatnot. Um, it's in Qt proper. Some things are still separate. And um, the so-called KDE frameworks is a collection of these uh, tools. Each one of these bullet points here is a more or less individual library. And um, you can use them, for example, to access zip files or tarballs or something like that. There's a very nice cute API for compressed I.O. called k-archive. Um, you have uh, a collection of high-quality proxy models that do, uh, for example, recursive searching in the tree model. Uh, feel free to use that. It's all open source. Uh, it's high quality, tested for years, um, and uh, peer-reviewed and whatnot. So um, I think in the abstract I said something like KDE is for Q, what boost is for STL. Um, I think that's really the case. Uh, KDE is where the innovation takes place and then it gets upstream in the long run to Qt proper. Then there is include.org. It's um, founded by uh, Cornelio Schumacher, also from KDE fame. And it's meant to give you a central website where you can go to if you're looking for anything that's missing in Qt. Uh, at the moment, it lists 184 uh, Qt libraries that solve various problems. And it makes it very easy to install them. So it shows you the, the library, where to, uh, the, the license, where to get it, even um, a Ruby tool to install stuff via the command line and update it and stuff like that. So again, if you use Qt, do have a look here if you ever find anything that's missing. <laughs> OK, so this was the overview of what you can do with Qt. There's a lot. I left out tremendous parts there. But I felt it was important uh, first to uh, establish the, the baseline before going into the misconceptions. I will talk about these four points here. Uh, code generators, containers, C++11 or XY, whatever the latest and greatest is. And then in the end, the development process of Qt itself. 
So let's start off with uh, code generators, not cute generators. <laughs> um, people keep complaining about mock, the meta object compiler. People even decide to fork an ancient version of Qt to replace mock for some reason. Um, the thing is, mock is just one of many code generators being used in Qt. And the others are the UI compiler. I showed that for uh, generating um, dialogue layouts and things. Uh, and the last one is the resource compiler. Both of them are never going to be replaced by C++ code. I doubt that someone will start adding the ability to parse and read files from the disk and generate code uh, from that, because this is what you do here, right? The resource compiler takes, for example, image files and compresses them if needed and puts them as binary data directly into your executable, making it super simple to um, deploy your code anywhere, right? You don't need to uh, send a full folder with hundreds of images. It's just going to be one executable and it's going to work everywhere. So the code generators are meant to improve the productivity of you as a developer. Um, they really simplify code maintenance, especially UI compiler. In KDE or even in, in customer code I've seen at KDAP, um, there's still old code that uses the manual C++ way of setting up a layout. And it's such a, ha a hassle to update that whenever you need to. Like, uh, okay, how does this actually look like? You have to figure it out by just reading the code. I don't work that way. I want to, like, if I want to change something visual, it's super cool to actually see it and then change, for example, the order of widgets or adding margins and paddings and whatever. And the code generators are there to overcome limitations in the C++ language. Some of them hopefully will get resolved, especially for mock over time. But others, like UIC or RCC, I don't ever see C++ um, fixing that. And also, let me stress something here. Uh, yes, Qt does use code generators, as does many, many other people's, uh, people or companies out there that maybe not use Qt. Um, a very good example here is the keynote from Mike Acton from last year's uh, CppCon. Uh, he said that the games community at large uses many code generators in various places for efficiency reasons mostly, or just to make writing code less mundane. You can do it in C++ oftentimes, but that would mean repetitive code or very ugly um, macro-based um, code bases. So let's talk, um, oh yeah, before I continue going in depth with mock, um, I want to say something that also many people uh, don't get for some reason. These tools, all of them that Qt ships, are very well integrated into various um, build tool chains. Better integrated than many other code generators um, like, I don't know, uh, Yak or Bison or something like that. Um, QMake obviously has native su support for it, but don't use QMake, quite frankly. It's, uh, it gets the job done, but in my opinion, CMake is a much superior build system. And that one as well has native support for uh, Automock and um, running RCC and UIC transparently. It's, it's super easy to get done. There's even an add-in for Visual Studio if you use that. Um, so you just run build and it will do its job. It's not hard to integrate these tools into your tool chain at all. So let's talk about mock. Um, people think that the so-called meta object compiler is mostly used for signals and slots. It was definitely one of the main reasons back then. But nowadays, in modern Qt 5, that's not the case anymore. I mean, sure, you need it for signals, that's true. But for slots, you don't need it at all. Oftentimes, you don't even have slots anymore. You just add a lambda. Uh, you use the new signal slot connection syntax, right? But rather, today in Qt 5, you use it for reflection. I mean, this is an implementation of reflection you can use in C++ today. I do hope that the work in the ISO CPP <laughs> standard is going to extend what you can do with C++ so we can replace more and more of what mock does by something that C++ offers you natively. But the last time that Olivier Goffard, the uh, maintainer of mock, looked at the standards papers, they, he didn't um, 
he wasn't able to replace Mock uh, completely yet. There's a very nice block entry written by him on the matter if you're interested in the whys on that. And the QMeta object, the reflection, is also the basis in, in the Qt world for wealth of uh, features like um, IPC mechanisms or language bindings. So QML, of course, is the obvious um, part here for the properties and property bindings. It's essential to have the features that Mock gives you. But it's also being used pervasively for Debos, uh, for Web Channel, the module that I personally maintain, with which you can transparently call QObject-based C++ code from JavaScript running potentially uh, inside uh, Qt WebKit or Qt Web Engine uh, view, but also works with Node.js or anything else. And then there's a project uh, spearheaded by Ford, where also colleagues of mine work uh, for helping them bring it uh, to fulfillment. It's the Remote Objects um, module, which uh, is IPC on a type safe level across C. Uh, it's also a very interesting um, project there. So I said it already, new signal slots, you don't need um, to create the overhead of a queue object just to get a slot to then maybe run something in a delayed manner, like here. With Qt5, you just use a lambda. This is how you should use it. There is no string comparison here, nothing. It's type checked at compile time. The questions. Even multi yes. Yes. Um, even uh, the, the question was whether this works even across threads. Yes, it does work across threads. What you need for threads is just a uh, declaration that the parameters you pass over, um, that they are declared and can, can be uh, encapsulated and moved across threads. But this is the same for the old single slot thing syntax. So this is not related here at all. So this is really what you should use everywhere. And then let's talk a bit about uh, efficiency. Mock has been around for 20 years. And I know that Copper Spice, this infamous uh, new fork of the ancient Qt 4.8 uh, version, is not as old. Um, I don't want to say uh, th the code they wrote is really, really bad, but I just want to highlight here something that they probably do not take into account and that people in Qt have taken into account for 20 years now. The code you generate with the um, code generator can be optimized really, really well to the sense that um, the code it generates is shared across different applications. Um, it is very minimal. It can only emit the code it's actually needing. So you can see here um, that the text and data sizes of the different uh, libraries. So this is Qt4, where Qt GUI um, was still one monolithic block. And then the second uh, bar is for Qt GUI and Qt widgets in Qt5, where it was separated into two. I took both into account here. And then you have Copper Spice UI library, so something that is uh, relating to Qt GUI in 4.8. So you can see the f overhead is nearly twice as large. If you dissect the binaries and look at where this comes from, it's just the signals and slots or the implementation thereof. It has a huge overhead. Also, when it comes to relocations, which really, really kills your um, startup speed for embedded platforms. So as soon as you try to replace Mock for the sake of replacing it, please at least think about the uh, impact that's going to have, especially uh, when it comes to the efficiency. OK. Uh, the next misconception I hear again and again um, from people uh, trying out Qt is that you have to use the Qt containers. Don't. There are many of them. Uh, <coughs> if you use them, do understand implicit sharing, the copy and write pattern that Qt implements. Um, you can write super efficient code when you leverage that properly, but it's not a magic bullet. You have to actually understand how to use it, right? If you do use them, only use Q vector and Q hash by default, and the rest only if you really find a hotspot that your profiler shows you. I never had that case. So really do not use QList, except if you have to interact with existing Qt API that uses QList. It's a pity, again, code legacy. But um, in your own data models, for example, it's super fine to use STL containers or boost containers. 
They're very good and pro in many parts even better than the Qt counterparts. There are other cases where the Qt containers are, are better, but only use them when you want to use them. There's no reason you have to use them. Then C++ 11 and Qt. People keep saying that, oh, um, Qt is so old because you cannot use a modern C++ with that. This is not true. It is true that up to 5.6, the people working on Qt inside Qt libraries are not allowed to use C++ 11 or not rely upon that. But they do optionally uh, enable a ton of features there, like um, const expert, default deleter, R value references, no except, null pointer, whatever, to improve the quality and the performance of the library today. With 5.7, finally, we can actually um, depend on a modern C++ 11 enabled compiler to then use it inside Qt. For example, this is going to be used to replace the handwritten assembly code for um, atomics in Qt. Uh, and we'll instead use STL um, counterparts there, which is uh, reducing the maintenance effort on our side, better integration with existing tools and whatnot. So this is really something I look forward to. But it's something for me as a Qt developer looking forward to. You, as a user of Qt on an application side, you can use the latest and greatest C++ features now, today, and it's going to work. And then last but not least, um, I want to mention the development process because there, again, many people uh, don't quite get it. Um, open governance, I mentioned that already. Uh, everyone can chime in, everyone can um, add features or uh, improve code. It's open source, but it's um, licensed, uh, or it's dual licensed. So you get the LGPL, GPL codes, or alternatively, a commercial license. When should you use one or the other? That's your decision. In my opinion, as a company who invests money in a product and wants to make sure that it's available for the next coming, what, 10 years or so, you should have um, an incentive to actually fund further, further Qt development by buying licenses from the Qt company. Again, not KDAP, but you can go through us, but it's not the thing, right? You want to make sure Qt thrives and continues to develop, and that's why you should um, buy licenses. And um, there's one thing in Qt which really stands out to me as uh, exceptional. That's the KDE Free Qt Foundation. It's been uh, established years ago by the original founders of uh, Trolltech, and they decided to make sure that no one can ever take the intellectual property of Qt and um, kill it. You cannot buy it and then just shove it under the, uh, under the earth, right? Um, this KDE Free Qt Foundation literally says that if new features get developed and uh, or if the existing code gets changed without releasing it for one year, then automatically all of the intellectual property and the rights thereto go over to KDE EV. There's a misconception. People think that automatically um, all of Qt becomes beast licensed. That's not the case. KDE EV, the uh, nonprofit organization that runs um, KDE things, gets the right to then decide what to do with it. It can, for example, release it as beast. But it could also say, no, let's create a consortium of um, companies in the field who are then maybe even allowed to, do, again, sell licenses under a dual license model, right? Don't mix that up. And by the way, this is also one of the main reasons for the CLA you have to sign when you contribute to uh, Qt. That's for the sole purpose of being able to relicense it as needed as the KDE EV uh, decides to. And with that, I come to an end. If there are any questions, please. Uh, I saw one of the slides, uh, there was task-based threading. Is that something that was in KDE lib or QD? Uh, the question was whether uh, what the task-based uh, threading is. I mentioned on uh, the KDE slide here, um, that one. That's the Threadweaver uh, library in KDE frameworks. Um, it's, in my opinion, far superior to what you get from Qt Concurrent or even plain uh, std async. 
Um, if you are interested interested in that, do check it out. It's uh, high quality. I like it a lot. Yes. You had a comment in there about accessibility, and I've noticed a lot of gap in many places in accessibility. Think of accessibility as like blind. They don't include colorblind or presbyopia or photosensitivity in the th in the list of things they worry about. So there's there's no fill of that gap. What does QT do in that? Um, quite frankly, uh, the question was um, regarding accessibility, which is mentioned here, um, whether CUTE, except for um, caring for blind people, also takes into account um, uh, color blindness and, and other um, yeah, issues. I quite frankly can't answer that uh, because I have uh, not worked with the, um, that yet. But if you have any questions to that, do contact Frederick Lathorn. He is the maintainer of the accessibility stack in Qt, and he cares very deeply about that. So um, probably there are ways to get it done. Uh, I know that in the KDE community, which is very large and it's being used by many, many people, there are um, people that have these kind of issues. So I don't know what they do there. but. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a solution to it, but I can't tell you what it is. Sorry. More questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that Qt, uh, Qt Quick uses QML and JavaScript. Is it only Qt Quick that has this dependence on JavaScript? Uh, and, and in what manner is it used? What, what's, what is the dependence there? OK, the, the question is, um, when we talk about Qt Quick, uh, that it's uh, what here? Um, QML and JavaScript, and whether Qt has a dependency on JavaScript, right? That was the question. Um, first, let me put this uh, straight. You can use uh, JavaScript in QML. Doesn't mean you should. And for some places, it's very handy to do so, but you should keep it to a minimum. And um, this is optional. And you can, for example, use the Qt script module. It's, again, a separate module to get language bindings to um, JavaScript. Or you use QML engine as a JavaScript engine to get language bindings. You can do that, but you don't have to. In Qt widgets, for example, you don't get any JavaScript at all. Does this answer your question? OK, thanks. So you can use QML with just C++? The question is whether you can use QML with uh, just C++. Yes, I mean, in the sense of you still write QML, right? Yeah. This is not C++. And then all the rest, the data and the logic, is on C++ side. Um, this is the ideal case, in my opinion. Uh, quite often, you will cut corners because it's just so much simpler to write one line of JavaScript instead of creating a C++ function and then uh, calling back and forth. But most of the time, yes, you write the magnitude of code and logic in C++ and use QML just for the representation. And what is output from QML steps so I can access it from my C++ application? Uh, the question is what the output of the QML uh, thing is. Um, it's actually a virtual mach machine, so to say. Like um, By default, it will um, produce um, jitted binary code and then run that. Uh, it's very efficient. Um, they spend a lot of effort in making it as fast as possible for this use case, and it's very good at that. Um, there is also a commercial QML compiler. It's a code-to-code -code transformer. So it takes the QML code and translates that into C++, which is then um, compiled by your compiler, running all its uh, optimizations on it, and thereby creating even faster code with even less overhead. And there's a, uh, sorry, what? QML compiler from the Qt company. Thank you. And um, regarding the um, how to interact with QML and uh, Qt, uh, the documentation that Qt has is very good. Um, you should have a look at that. And they have lots of chapters on just that um, part, like how to get data from C++ to QML and vice versa. And there's uh, support for that. Very. Uh, okay. The, yes. The question is about the Android support and uh, whether the gap is um, um, re reducing in what you can do on Android compared to what you can do on other platforms, um, especially widgets have been mentioned. Um, 
with OpenGL content, uh, I, I'm again not the expert. My colleague Bogdan would be the best, uh, best person to ask there. I'm pretty sure there has been a blog post uh, maybe a few months ago on just that matter, if I'm not mistaken. On our website, catup.com slash blog, I think um, me and my colleagues uh, put technical um, blogs there. And he definitely had a very long series about Android and Qt. And I think he mentioned something there. But again, do contact him directly or come to me afterwards, and I'll get you the contact details. Does this answer your question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> The question is how to figure out whether a bug is fixed if you find it in 5.4 or 5.6. Um, the answer is you look into the bug tracker. Um, there's, it's open, right? It's, uh, you just either report the bug you find, and then someone will try it that and say, oh, actually, this is a duplicate. This is here, the a main bug, and it's been fixed already. Alternatively, you can go into Garrett. Uh, or just git check out the latest and greatest and see whether the code has changed. Um, personally, I really like this about Qt. It's open, right? You can actually look into what it is doing. And if something goes wrong, you go in there and either fix it yourself and sub submit a patch, or you check upstream whether it's been fixed already. Maybe you can even backport um, the fix then if you want to. Um, so yeah, I would start with the um, debug tracker. If you use IRC, there's also a Qt Labs channel on, or the, the Qt channel on Freenode, where you can ask these kind of questions and people will uh, help you out. Stack Overflow is very active, a community there. There are lots of mailing lists as well, where people will help you out if you have any uh, question there. This is your um, channels on how to get in touch with us. Does this answer your question? Yeah, okay, cool. one part of the UI and then I have to go further to see the second part in that same code, let's say on the desktop, and show all of it? Is there some kind of, yeah, is there something the, in that the, direction? Let me repeat the question as I got it. Um, whether Qt uh, Quick and QML supports uh, Story Builder to adapt to different uh, form factors in the sense that one screen is only shown uh, on a small display, whereas multiple screens or content wise is uh, shown on um, the desktop, for example. Um, if you mean with Story Builder some graphical application, then no. Um, people from the automotive industry are investing money in uh, improving Qt uh, tooling around these kind of things, as far as I know. But it's possible today um, to write QML code which automatically adapts to different form factors. There's very good support for that, for example, to load um, different images based on the uh, DPI or whatever, to um, change the layout, you can uh, even here, for example, this kind of uh, code could be a um, so-called component, which you use in different uh, files. And you can load these components based on the DPI or resolution of your device, right? So you could have one component for a small form factor and one component with slightly different code for a larger screen. And because it's so simple to write that, um, it's actually uh, working very well. So does this answer your question? It's over. Okay, so with that, I have to come to an end. Thanks for attending. <laughs>